Welcome to Linux Saloon, a place to discuss tech, open source, and where Linux is always on tap. Each show, we'll have a talk about a Linux project, generally a Linux distribution, like today, Fedora 36. But, you know, we could also do a, a desktop environment or an application, have an open mic night. Anything that is Linux tech and open source related is on the table for discussion. Today, I have Eris here. He's helping to keep me on track once again, and as well as... Colin's going to carry the show for us all, and, and I have the rest of the panel here, Servan, Schickel, Jinda, Mark, and Tyler, to make sure that I don't screw up too badly. So thank you all for being here. How is everyone? Excellent. Good. Good. Okay, you got a lot of work ahead of you all today, so I appreciate everything that you're going to put toward the mm -hmm. show. So on the docket, as I teased earlier, we're going to be talking about Fedora 36. We're going to check what's on the menu for next week. We'll get into some Linux news, a community free pour and last call. Welcome, Ben. How's it sounding? Good enough. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So Colin, you have started talking before the show saying what awesome things you're doing with Rolling Rhino. Actually, you didn't say that. You just said you had been playing with it, but I'm just assuming it's awesome. So go ahead and tell everybody what awesomeness is going on in your world. Um, well, I've just been, um, well, we did the uh, Ubuntu challenges a, little, a few weeks ago. Um, so it, it piqued my interest, this rolling Rhino. I've been doing a series of installs in VirtualBox on real hardware just to see how this distro performs as far as rolling goes because they, they've now implemented, and I don't know if anyone's heard of this, a package, <clears throat> an alternate alternate package manager called Nala. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. It's um, it, it, it's a replacement for apt. And um, it has a what they call a human readable format within the terminal. And it looks quite nice. And it's easy to read, easy to understand with the terminal output. So that's quite interesting. And it's now going to be on the next release um, implemented uh, as a Full, it's going to be permanently implemented within the within their desktop. <clears throat> and um, I was also messing around with installing other desktop environments as well <clears throat> with a, excuse me, with a minimal install, with a normal install. Um, the problem I came across was with the minimal install, no matter which desktop I chose to install, it came along with the known desktop. So I don't know whether that, needs to be included with another desktop environment. I couldn't install another one without having GNOME installed. So that was uh, interesting. But um, yeah, it's a rolling release and never have to reinstall. And the only, the only update you have to do is run rhino-update. You don't have to do apt, uh, apt update and apt upgrade. It's just one command. So very interesting. They've got their own uh, repos and they follow the, I think the devel repositories or the development, the Ubuntu re development repositories. So you don't have to install from one um, interim release to another. It just keeps following. So that's quite interesting. And pretty much you get Ubuntu out of the box with the snap packages and everything like that. They just have their own little tools and their own little implementation of how to update um, the, the Nala process. So you just install things with Nala rather than apt. And uh, it's, I found that quite interesting. So I've been using it and it seems to work pretty well. So I don't know if anyone else has seen it but or heard of Nala, but uh, it's quite a nice little terminal output. This is the first I've heard of Nala. Now, uh, Jinda, I think you have, <clears throat> I think that is what, it looks like what he's, uh, what, what Colin's been talking about. So that looks, yeah, that looks like it. That's very interesting. I, I like that this, um, it, it feels like to me, it's kind of taking apt and, and moving it to like the next level here in many ways. Okay. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention like, is Nala uses parallel downloads. Yeah, I see that, yeah. So that's, yes, that's the difference between that and apt. It actually installs things a lot quicker as well. And they also they also have a, a thing called pack stall um, in Rolling Rhino. And it's like a, uh, they've got this repository, which is like a, an Arch AUR, 
um, for, for their Ubuntu um, release. And uh, although <clears throat> I've tried one or two packages, they didn't work. There are some packages there you can install, but there's not a huge amount at the moment. Maybe that's just going to be growing moving forward. But um, yeah, I don't know how that's um, maintained or anything. I haven't really gone into that, but uh, it's there. You know it can... What they're using as a backend for the parallel downloads? Do you know what they're using? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Oh, it was like wget or curl or something. I've, I've recently discovered something called aria2, A-R-I-A-2. Uh, that, that's like an somewhat like a newer tool implementation. Like it, many uh, apps use that as a backend for like parallel downloads. So there's a right. tool for Arch called a power pill. Like it's, it's promoted by Garuda, Linux and other people. It's like parallel downloads. Like Arch has parallel downloads, but it's like from a single mirror. But if you want parallel downloads from multiple mirrors, Arch doesn't give you. You have to use other tools, but most of them use ARIA2 as a backend. Right. So what do you see this Naria, Nala, I'm sorry, Nala. What, what, do you, what do you see happening with this in the future? Do you see this replacing apt on maybe other Debian distributions? Do you see this as a, just a, a one-off? Where, where do you think this is going to go? Um, well, apparently, I think there's a developer that works on it, and they, they spoke to the developer um, and, and decided to get him on board. I think that's how it worked, if, if, I'm, if I read that correctly or, or remembering correctly. So they decided to take that on board and... Um, and realize that uh, like the terminal output's really nice. It's just really format. It's got these, a lot of things come in like a little box. It's got a box around what you've just uh, organized and, and little arrows uh, with what's happening and what you're reading. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's really nice output. It kind of reminds me of, of um, yep. how DNF does, does their um, package management a little bit. Not, not, not with the boxes so much, but the, but the, how it has the columns of information? Yes, I've just noticed that on um, on um, Fedora actually, it, it is a little bit like that. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it's an interesting project. Yeah, I know. I kind of think that you know this is formatted. It's it's way easier to parse the information just by looking at it than apt. And to me, this seems like this is what this is where apt should be going. You know, I don't know if they can maybe incorporate some of the these concepts into apt or replace it. I don't know. But this is yeah, this is nice. It is nice, yeah. It's um, it's good to be able to sort of quickly read and understand what's happening in the terminal because apt can be sort of um, very texty mm -hmm. and and yep. hard to sort of see what's going on at times and and hard to to try and find what you're looking for if there's an error or or something like that. It's just yeah, it's like they call it human readable. Right. <clears throat> Humans like columns yeah. and organization. Is anybody else here doing anything with Nala, or, or is this, or is Colin, is Colin, is Colin the cheese that stands alone on this one? He <laughs> stands alone, mate. The cheese that stands alone. The question is, is he a stinky cheese that stands alone? We'll never know because he's virtual. <laughs> That's very cool. Is there anything else about rolling Rhino that you want to um, uh, touch on? No, not really. I mean, um, no, I'm, I'm running it on real hardware as well as well as VMs and. The, the, the nice thing about VMs is you can do a snapshot. If you do a minimal install, you actually come up into a TTY and then you run everything from there. So you've got to do a Rhino dash in it to start with and then a Rhino dash update and then you're on track. And then you there's a tool called um, Rhino dash D-E-I-N-S-T, I think it is, des short for des desktop environment install, deinst, and then you you can install the desktop. The only advantage I've seen with the minimal install is even though whatever desktop you choose, it comes with GNOME, it has very, very minimal GNOME packages. So you you barely notice any GNOME packages on the desktop hmm. that you choose. So in, in the VM, you can take a snapshot at the point where you're at the TTY, so you can keep just trying different uh, desktops to see how oh, it Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. It, you can use uh, the uh, virtual box in so many ways. And, and then once you finish that, just go back to your snapshot and you're back to where your, your install is. And then you can try another desktop environment. So using snapshots can be quite good to 
test these things out. Yeah. You know, that's a lot like cheating. So like when I play like old Nintendo games now, I keep sa- doing save states. And so when I die, I go back to the previous save state. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I can- so you're actually cheating yeah. at Linux. <clears throat> and I think we need to keep that in mind. Everybody, Colin cheats at Linux. He takes snapshots <laughs> and he rolls oh, yeah. it and he goes it's, back to the snapshots. Called- <laughs> it, it's called working smarter, not harder. I, I like cheating better. It's, you're, you're cheating the system. You're, <laughs> someone once said, was it Dreaming Wolf? Uh, it's supposed to hurt a little bit. And, and I'll, I'll, <laughs> no, that's very cool. I, uh, I, I like, now are you doing the snapshots with, with uh, VirtualBox or are you doing it with... Uh, a yeah, yeah Virtual VirtualBox, yeah. Okay, all right. VirtualBox, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin, for that. I appreciate it. That's, that's, uh, you're always doing something neat. Sure. And, I, and I appreciate hearing these little things. It's got like the Colin segment now instead of the, sure. um, you know, what have you doing in Linux? <laughs> but, you know, that's fine. <clears throat> Sravan, you have some exciting news to share with everybody. And so I'm expecting the, um, the cheerleaders to start cheering as soon as you tell us <laughs> this. So, Jinda, get your mic ready. I think Mark, maybe too. I think you, <laughs> I think you talked about this sort of thing. Ben, maybe. Ben, perhaps. So what what's going on? Oh boy, I'm gonna cheer, Mr. McBride will cheer. He'll 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 do me a salad and, and give me a good, you know, yippee yay or something like that. Yippee yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a so, short intro. Like I I bought a Raspberry Pi like late March. Yep. From yeah. then I've been like sort of involved with the Endeavor ARM team, and so in mid April I started working on a Calamari's installer for ARM. To bring it in line with the main install process, as you know, like the main Endeavor OS uses mm-hmm. the Calamari's installer to give you options. Like we have, we offer like 14 different desktop environments, most of them mm-hmm. vanilla, except window managers, which are themed. So it's like, how do you bring that uh, for the ARM? Because earlier the ARM install uses like three different scripts. Like you have to run them like alongside. It's like for more like advanced users. But now it's like we have a button on the main ISO. So the, we released the Artemis edition yesterday. So on the main ISO, you have a button called install ARM. And then you just put your micro SD card on your laptop or whatever, click that button, and it will take you through a process. It will burn the image. And when you load the image on your Raspberry Pi or Odroid, you'll just see a simple Calamars installer like asking you for mm. keyboard layout, language, uh, and then the desktop environment, what you want, your username, computer. Like it's like a normal Calamars install. So it's it's like way simpler. Like I worked on I worked on it for like almost two months now. It's finally released. I'm happy to see it out. And we I think we got like positive review from nine to five Linux. Mm-hmm. They actually did the install process and posted like screenshots of the process. Oh nice. On their mm-hmm. website. I was like, okay, this actually works. It's not like not even I find it easy because I design, I did it so many times because obviously it's easy for me, but other people find it easy too. That was good to see. Well, that's excellent. So wow. you are on the ARM Endeavor OS team, right? Yep. And then, so what do you do? What kind of things uh, do you, what kind of magic do you, you know, pull out of, pull out of your, your hat to make, not a red hat necessarily, but a hat <laughs> and, uh, and, and to make this happen? Mm-hmm. So uh, as like people who have used a Raspberry Pi here, you have everything on the SD card, right? Mm-hmm. So you don't have like in normal computers, how you install stuff is you have a live USB, mm-hmm. you have a hard disk, which is in a computer. So what the live USB does is shoot onto the hard disk, make changes there. And then once it does it, when you reboot, you know, you boot off your hard disk. But ARM, you can't do that because everything, you don't have that cheered stuff. It's like you have a single micro SD card. So what I did was have an image with Calamaris already installed on it with this simple open box environment. Like I have literally like five packages for the environment. I have open box, tint for the panel, XSE for the terminal, PCMan FM to set the wallpaper and give a file manager. That's it. Like literally like four packages to get a minimal desktop environment. We launched Calamaris on it and there's no chirut here. So that, so in the modules, you can select like whatever you want to choose for Calamaris. I don't mm-hmm. chirut. We do the exact same steps as the main install does, but right in that same micro SD card. So you're making changes directly, but when you reboot the default 
uh, user is uninstalled. Like we remove the default user, we remove some of the open box and Calamari's packages, like there's a cleanup going on. But all the changes what you do is on the same micro SD card. So you're installing the desktop environment on the micro SD card. So that's the little bit of trick I pulled off. I don't think anyone else did it. So it's 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 simple. It's the same thing as a main installer, but certain steps like modified or under remove. Like we don't need the partitioning because mm -hmm. the partitioning is done by script when you install the image. Right. And there's some tricks I pulled off, but uh, it's like so. The, now it's like easier to keep the ARM edition in, in line in sync with the main edition. So whatever changes are there, we can immediately get over this, like all the improvements, like all the services, what they enable, like firewall, everything, like all the main services, like the main installer does, it's in a, the same thing can be implemented in ARM without much effort. It's like, I just have to build Column Mars package, it, the correct configs. I have everything in the main edition for the ARM too. Okay, so then the Simple install press. files are all on the SD card when you install it. So is it an offline installer, or is it required, or does it have to be like it's online? A, it's an online installer. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's so, so it's a so it's a, a net installer. So it pulls all the packages down dynamically. No. When you... basically the image already has the base. It has Firefox. It oh, has okay. Everything. Only the desktop environment is missing. So if you choose Mate, it'll install Mate. If you choose GNOME, it'll oh, install okay. GNOME. Everything else is already there. So and other thing I did, which I find strange why other teams aren't doing it. Again, they are more experienced. I'm using Jets Z standard compression. Okay. It's so fast to uncompress for the user. It's like users have reported like three, four, four minutes uncompression time. So I did Fedora ARM, which we'll discuss mm -hmm. later, and Manjaro ARM. Okay. These guys use XZ form XZ compression. It's like XZ is sold. It takes like 11 to 15 minutes to just uncompress the image. And then it takes more five to six minutes to burn the image. For us, entire process will take 15 minutes or even less, depending on internet speed. It's like everything is so fast. There's no multi-step. Everything is in sync. You don't need to use a terminal anywhere. Most of these processes, you have to use a terminal initially to uncompress the image. Then to burn the image, you can use either H or Rofer for other process. But for us now, everything is in sync. Everything is like, you don't need to use a terminal for the most part at all. No, not from at all. You do, everything is GUI or TUI. The initial part, initial like image burning process is TUI, but everything mm -hmm. else is GUI. So that way, like it's less, uh, it's it's more accessible to people. Like I know Endorus is not meant for beginners. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't recommend myself to beginners, but it's more accessible to general users with this new install process. For the arm. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. Now, how has your yeah. experience with Endeavor OS been with ARM? Have Have you had any like? Is it pretty much same same kind of experience you get on x86 architecture? Yes, it's pretty much the same. Sometimes the packages are a little bit outdated because Arch Linux ARM is not official. The okay. group of again, I mean, Arch is not like. Arch is basically a group of volunteers, right? It's an organized group of volunteers. Same with mm -hmm. Arch Sam. Most of the important packages are up to date, but you get similar experience. Everything is same. Like I, I build our packages for the ARM repos. Everything's the same. Most of the things you, which you find in Arch Linux, AUR, everything. Like, but some packages, as you know, are architecture dependent. Apart from that, most of the things you can build on ARM, you can use on ARM. It's again, you have to keep in mind, these are not like super powerful devices. So you have to keep in mind the use case, but except Plasma on the Raspberry Pi, I'm able to get really good desktop environment experience on everything, VLAN, XR on the Raspberry Pi. I have another SBC called Oldroid, which is a little more powerful, that's six cores. I, I was able to watch a 4K video on Plasma VLAN. Like, that's awesome. These are powerful devices. I'm just using like a normal desktop operating system. The, Best thing about, I think, Endeavor Sam is like, it gives you flexibility. You can either choose one of our 14 desktop environments or you can just choose like a headless server or even like a plain, you can just choose a base packages. You won't install any desktop environment, but then you can install whatever you want to the command line on your first boot. So it's it's all about flexibility. You can do whatever you want in your system. It's just an easier way to get you started. Because I personally, I'm not that happy with the uh, Ubuntu ecosystem. Like 
if you see the base Raspberry Pi images and other stuff, it's like really old kernels, really old software. I find Arch Linux like the base to be more up to date because the problem with this is like these devices get revisions every year. I'm on revision 1.5 of the Raspberry Pi. I can't boot some images because my, I need a newer kernel <laughs> or something like that. It's like, right. you need, it's, it's better if you have like good newer software. And I think that's a good way. It's, it'll give more options for people, but I know Raspberry Pi, most people will use Raspbian or something, but I think we we'll, love, we'll offer a good option and it makes, it makes it more accessible for it, at least people to try out now because earlier, like everyone has to go to terminal, do a bunch of steps, but now it's like, just just have the ISO, load it, click a button, you're done. No, I think that's great. I think what you're doing, the kind of work you're doing right now is going to make ARM more relevant as a platform to target because there's more work being done on it, I think, especially for the Raspberry Pi and I don't know how the Odroid um, Mm -hmm. life is but i i think that's really great to see and and i'm i'm excited that you know the, those that kind of work is being done it's gonna make arm based devices easier to to start using i think so i know mr mcbride you uh you hopped on and so did prophetic uh did, did you guys have any any thoughts on on arm based endeavor west are you are you the fans of the arm or the endeavor i'm just a fan of someone saying hey this could be easier. Why hasn't this been done? And I'm just going to do it. So Absolutely. I applaud him for, for <laughs> taking you. the effort and doing that. And I think we need more of that. And uh, it's cool that he's a newer Linux user and he just went do dove right in in Arch yeah. World and, uh, and started doing some stuff in ARM, which I think is a platform that we should target more. Uh, so I'm just pumped about that. I haven't tried it out yet or uh, anything like that, but um, I'm just excited that you know uh, it's being done. For sure, yeah, I think that's great. You have the uh, what? Well, yeah, the work being done on ARM to, to make it better, and the fact that Servan, who is new-ish to Linux, has jumped in and helped with one of the harder bases, Arch, exactly. to, to make it better. I think that's that says a lot about you. So thank you very much. I speak for the trees when I say thank you. So. <laughs> Although I'm not the Lorax. All right, well, excellent. I, I think uh, I, I'm starting to feel like I'm just, I'm, gonna, I'm just spitballing this. I'm not saying we're going to do this next. But the idea of maybe doing something like, a, I don't know how many people have Raspberry Pis or ARM-based systems lying around to play with, but it'd be fun to do a distribution challenge with something like pick something that's not Raspberry Pi OS and let's talk about it. I don't know, is that, how does that sound, Eris? Does that sound like something decent or does that sound like I'm, I'm getting too unwieldy that could that could be done um th the good thing about a about a raspberry pi is you just need an extra sd card and you can just take right. it out and put it something else in so let's i don't know let's let's, uh, let's mull that over a little bit you know with some cinnamon and uh think and about... i've been like making emphasis of trying out arm is available if you remember i tried open to budgie arm mm -hmm. and today i'll share my experience of fedora arm too Cool. I'm, I'm trying out as many as I can. Yeah, it's been a challenge for Fedora. Um, I couldn't even find the install metal until. He, who is this grumpy? I don't know his actual name. He gave me the link in the Linux challenge chat, so was, I, I was actually able to get the instructions to get Fedora on Raspberry Pi. They don't have it on the main. <laughs> it was one of my complaints. I'll, I'll talk about it later, but I was able to install it. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it. That's cool. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate bringing that up. Go ahead, <clears throat> Colin. <clears throat> I was going to say it. it um, <clears throat> it'd be nice to see. Um, it just goes to show how. Uh -oh. And it'd be nice if um, Linux could start adopting that as a universal installer. At least we have one way of installing Linux, <laughs> which would make it easier for adoption for people to come to Linux. I think we that we could benefit from that. At least, if anything, um, because then you've got. Different, yeah, we've got different bases and so forth, different desktop environments, but at least if you've got a, the same installer, it gives people um, half a chance of uh, getting it installed. It, it'd be do, nice. Do you know why it's so flexible, Colin? Because anyone can write a Python module. Again, Python is easy to code. And then right. if, it, if it is widely adopted, 
they'll write a C++ code for it and include it in the main column RS. It's right. like, it's a community effort. Like many distributions contribute to it. We contributed to it. Manjaro contributes to it. Arco contributes to it. Hmm. Like the the KDE guys contribute to it. It's like a community effort. Like anytime, again, I'm new to Linux, as you all guys know. Anytime yeah. I see like a community project, like Arch Linux is a community project, like Debian, like when community comes together, like good things happen. And yeah. It's interesting to say that Lubuntu uses Calamari's, which is an interesting breakaway because usually, you know, Ubuntu based derivative uh, flavors stick with the uh, Ubuntu installer. But Lubuntu yeah. kind of broke the mold a little bit. And I think that's cool too. Yeah. I don't know if everybody knows this, but a few weeks back, maybe a couple of months, maybe less than that, um, I don't know if he's the lead designer of Calamari's. He resigned from his position. Yeah, oh, really? Did. Yeah. It seems um, that replacement will come around later this year. So, Devon, what did you do? <laughs> I didn't do anything. I, I didn't even put <laughs> any pull requests or something. Maybe I will over the next few months. We are trying to improve the installer, make it more integrated, like without the script. So that's a plan. I don't know how long it will take. It's like, Instead of like running the TUI script, it's like everything will be done in Calamaris, but maybe that's a plan for later. I've just started exploring it. I'm relaxing after a release yesterday. <laughs> maybe we have we have some um we got quite a few distros now that are using Calamaris where whereas they've got package choices and also NVIDIA uh, driver installers hmm. uh, nice. during the install. Yeah which is uh, very flexible. I think even, Ben, your StormOS is, or is it the other one that I tried out? One of no, them it's uh, StormOS does come with the NVIDIA drivers in the installer now. Yeah, okay. So, and and to, you know, it's very nice to to do an install and go, oh, well, I'll install that, I'll install that. But, you know, how many packages can you put on there? Probably, yeah. you, you could probably... Um, do a curated list of some of the most popular packages, which I think some people yeah. do. And, yeah. and even Peppermint now have adopted that process as well to install. We don't include a crap ton of packages like most do. Like, you know, Arco includes a heck of a lot. And, um, you know, a lot of other Arch distributions include a heap of packages. And so that's why we don't give users the heap of packages like that we give them very minimal and that's it like i've always said so but yeah i think that calamari's is a very easy framework to work with and you know if only there was more distros that would adopt it like you said colin that then you know we could ease people into linux a heap of a lot easier than you know a lot of like ubiquity with ubuntu and uh you know all these others that are just in my opinion, not as easy as Calamari's way of doing well, things. Well, I would I never like to argue in favor of some distributions, but I do think like Elementary does a great job with theirs. Theirs is a pretty super, there's a super simple, like, yeah, that's easy. Like, ev even that's a fairly... cubicle Nate could do it, yeah. kind of install. Uh, Isn't that similar to Pop OS installer? Yeah, there's a history behind it. So Cassidy James was on Pop OS, employed by Pop OS when he was ah. writing the code. So he wrote the code both for elementary, both right. the app store and the installer. So he wrote the code for both, both the app store and installer. So elementary and Pop, hmm. Pop OS set an app store for with Flatpak and also the installer. Hmm. Yeah, I like the installer. I don't like anything else about elementary, but I like the installer. Hmm. <laughs> I can understand that. I think we all have Linux dreams, don't we? <laughs> we do. Well, excellent. So let's uh, let's move on to the main topic, and that is Fedora 36 and all of its flavors or spins. Spins. So the rules. I lay down the rules here, so we all are on the same sheet of music. The intent is to talk about the different aspects of the OS and discuss our experience after using it. This is a discussion that, by which only objective and constructive thoughts about the product are, are going to be, you know, accepted. So non-objective opinions like this is garbage, it's not helpful, but not so much what I want to hear, but rather if you say, I wish it had this feature or that feature, or I wish it would do this better, would be more useful for people that watch this after the fact and, you know, developers if they, if they choose to uh, be 
you know, watch this as well. So I, I want to benefit the con be have beneficial conversation to everybody. The point of this is to highlight the positives, but not to ignore the lowlights of the project as well. Remember that with open source software, it's a labor of love. And so let's not poo poo on it. So Eris, there was a straw poll. I'd like for you to uh, tell us all how Fedora did. So the results of the poll was 46% said it's amazing, tip of the hat. 14% said it's okay. 14% said I'm not having a good time with it. 9% said I'm not interested in trying it. 4% said I'm unable to do the exploration. 9% said I'm not interested in doing the explorations in general. And then 4% said other. And the other response was trying out micro OS desktop again after playing with tumbleweed. Well, I like uh, hearing for, that. And then that, that was for Telegram. And for Matrix, 75% of uh, the poll said, it is amazing, tip of the hat. And 25% said, I'm not interested in doing the explorations in general. So very well done on the pun with the tip of the hat. You make, you, you, will, you are an awesome dad joker. Joke, dadder, dad, dad joke. Yeah, a dude that does dad jokes. Well done. So a little bit about Fedora Linux. So Warren Tagami began Fedora Linux in 2002 as an undergraduate project at the University of Hawaii. Didn't know this. Intended to provide a single repository for well-tested third-party software packages so that non-Red Hat software would be easier to find, develop, and use. Fedora Linux, then known as Fedora Core, was a fork of Red Hat Linux launched in 2003. When Red Hat Linux was discontinued, so the team could focus on their paid version for servers, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Fedora's cutting edge distro, it has four foundations, freedom, friends, features, and first. Fedora is dedicated, like an alliteration. Fedora is dedicated to free software and content, advancing software and content freedom as a central community goal, which they accomplish through the software and content they promote. The Fedora community is made up of people from all walks of life working together to advance free software. There's a place for Fedora for anyone who wants to help, regardless of technical, still out, technical skill level, as long as they believe in the same core values. Fedora believes that change, changes are best developed in direct con concert with the upstream software communities whose work is part of the Fedora distribution. Fedora creates two major OS releases every year, targeted for the fourth Tuesday in April and October. Fedora always aims to provide the future first. In some ways, Fedora is like a, because they, they, they do a lot of updates. I find that they, they, it, they're they almost kind of like rolling, but not, I don't know, like, like, a, like a U rolling, like a, like a seesaw. I don't know, that's not rolling at all. All right, so some of the ISO options. They have I heard no, someone mention it as semi-rolling. Semi yeah, I've, I've heard that too, well. semi-rolling, yeah. So for the ISO options, we have no workstation, which is the main ISO. And then there are several spins among them, KDE Plasma, XFCE, Mate Compiz, LXQ, the Cinnamon Desktop, LXDE, which surprises me, the SOAS Desktop, and i3 Tiling Window Manager. Does anybody, does anybody here use the, anything more obscure of that group? Oh, I did the Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Well, that's, I wouldn't call Cinnamon, yeah. cinnamon obscure. Yeah, it's not obscure. Yet. I went with the XFCE. Okay, of course you did. Of course you did. I'm Mr. XFC, as you know, Nate. I know. You. I and tried the KDE this time. Okay. Cool. Well, excellent. Um, the arm was there and only in GNOME, so I tried only GNOME. Okay. So what I want to do is let's talk about the setup process that we we all had that we had. Just kind of fire some stuff away, and then then before we move on to the next section, I want to talk Servan. I want him to talk about his experience with the setup process as well. So, Eris, did you get a chance to try Fedora? I did. And which one Which one did you... Uh, I did. Uh, I installed um, GNOME, but I didn't use it very much. And I mostly used uh, Plasma. All right, so how was the setup process for you? And by that, just so for clarification, down, finding, downloading the ISO and getting it installed to a working desktop. How, how did that process go for you? I think that uh, it was pretty simple getting the ISO for the main distro, but the spins are kind of hidden, I think, unless you search for them like a search engine or something inside the, there's probably a link there, but it wasn't obvious how to get to the spins. 
Um, and installing it was fine. Um, what I usually do with Fedora, because it tries to do uh, ButterFS, I just give it like a, a big block of empty space and just tell it to do it automatically. And it uses it and it partitions all the different partitions with ButterFS that it needs, and I don't need to worry about it. Did you have any issues at all in the setup of ButterFS? I think everything went fine. I didn't have any issues. Um, I, I, now that I do remember, I do have the issue that my computer, I don't know, it might be too old. It will not work uh, with Fedora Plasma out of the box. So I have to go into hmm. basic um, graphics in order to install it. That's interesting. How old is the laptop? Uh, it's getting old. It's like 11 years, something like that. Ah, that's basically new <laughs> for a guy like me. But um, I never have that issue usually. Like all the distros, they usually install fine. But I think it might be because Fedora uh, defaults to Wayland on Plasma. And maybe it's not ready. Usually for GNOME, I don't have any issues installing it and running it out of the box. And yeah. Hmm. That is the strange thing is one of my SPC called the Odroid. In X11 on Plasma, I get screen tearing, flickering, all the things when I open Firefox or like literally anything. But on Wayland, it's it's like butter, butter smooth. But I'm surprised you have the opposite experience. Wayland is supposed to fix screen tearing. It's supposed yes. to have like a full frame every single time. So that shouldn't really happen ever. That, yeah, that's what happened for me. It's like I have such a good experience on Wayland. But just because of barrier, I can't use it. <laughs> Yep, that's that's interesting. I, I wonder why could you switch could you have switched to X uh X11 instead of Wayland for that computer? Like was it what, so it was when you were setting it up or when you were um going to run it for the first time? I if if I if I load a uh, Fedora Plasma, I might get the login screen and I've noticed this in past past um versions too. And maybe I could log in, but then it just stops working. Like my screen goes like, like a little bit like neon colors and it oh. just doesn't work anymore. I can't That's... even drop down to TTY. So I, really? I must, uh, I must install it and try it out uh, by doing the basic graphics. Otherwise it doesn't work. Do you have Personally. NVIDIA Iris? Yeah, I have NVIDIA. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, and then I, I guess we're still doing the, the, um, the setup, but uh, I, yes. I do have the issue that with the graphics, if I run the, the, the open source graphics for uh, Nouveau, then it seems like everything's working. But then if the computer falls asleep, the login screen will not let me log in again. It will not finish loading. Oh, that's fun. It, it, just, it just shows the wallpaper and then I cannot log in. The, the proprietary drive works, but it, the, the Nouveau does not work. And that, that, that usually doesn't happen to me as far as like any other distro for like well i tried looking at the at the logs i couldn't see anything out of the norm that's interesting so it's probably an nvidia issue then i'm thinking something related to nvidia anyway probably most likely have you tried xorg i think you can choose it on the sgdm yeah after i do the um i mean for, for gnome it works fine gnome works fine with, okay. with Nuvo, i think um I didn't try to do too much this time, but usually it works fine. But as, as far as Plasma, like I have to install it with basic graphics. And then after I, it's done installing, then when I log in, before I log in, I, I make sure to switch it from Wayland to XOR. And then it, it runs fine, except for that, uh, um, the login screen, if, I, if the computer falls asleep. You, you should try one of the spins because they don't use Wayland. That'd be interesting to see whether you have a different result. So that would be interesting. So we'll go ahead and just wait. So go ahead and download. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but it, no works and you should use the vault too. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder why. I wonder what the, what the uh, special uh, herbs and spices are that makes it different. So I did uh, try to boot, go ahead. boot the uh, games spin okay. on physical hardware with, with NVIDIA and I couldn't get the video to uh, start. Mm. So. How old was the computer? Uh, Probably about ten years old, and uh, yeah, but it's uh, is one of the old EG Force NVIDIA cards. Um, usually, it's pretty good for uh, Linux distros, but um, maybe I just want to comment on their their uh, their setup process. Any any other thoughts on on downloading the version, like if they could find the spin or anything like that? 
Yeah, I'll back up Aris here. I I, I thought it was um, very hard to find spins. Found them. I think I think actually I <clears throat> I, I went to Telegram and clicked on Aris's link, so I just couldn't find them. <laughs> yeah, that was how I got it there also. Yeah, I, I actually searched specifically Fedora spins to find it. I didn't see the link. I was a little slow. And I saw it was there on the page, but I was too impatient. So Ben, what, what, did, what did you want to uh, say? I wanted to comment my portion of it. Um, sure, go right well, ahead. Well, I found when I was trying to find the XFC ISO, I agree it was kind of a pain in the neck to find the, the spins on the website, but I did eventually find it and uh, download it. Install went fine, no problems at all. But uh, the thing was, the post install is where I got kind of messed up and whatnot. So when we get into that, I'll delve more into those things. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to comment on their setup process for for Fedora? I, so I've been running Fedora 36 for the last month and a half-ish. Uh, on my main workstation, it was I just upgraded from Fedora 35. The upgrade process was pretty seamless. Maybe I had to re-enable re a couple of repos, and I was good to go. I think Major RPM Fusion was good to go as well. Uh, I did... So this one was more interesting. I did another upgrade. I was going through like a stack of SSDs that I use for testing distros on, on my spare machine. And I came across one that had a old install of Fedora KDE, but it was Fedora 32 with my heavily customized plasma setup that I used to use years ago. And the interesting thing I ended up finding with that is I was able to go through that upgrade process. I think I went from like 32 to 34, then 34 to 35 before going to 36. And other than having to reinstall to upgrade uh, Latte Dock and some of the plasmoids, I was able to get everything up and running just fine on that. Uh, then earlier today, just because I had time to kill, uh, I decided I'm going to do a clean install of Fedora 36 because so far all of my experience had been upgrading, right? So I did a mm -hmm. Twitch stream of installing Fedora 36, a clean install of Workstation on a spare SSD on that machine back there, a 120 gig SSD. I uh, just wiped whatever was on that SSD, uh, booted up, was able to go through the install process just fine. But I'm used to it. Uh, I can understand why some people find the non-linear install process of going into a setting and then going back out of it uh, a little confusing. But I just did the default disk setup because I just wanted to use the entire 120 gig SSD and it was perfectly fine. You muted, Nate. Yeah, Nate. Stop it. <laughs> I think we should all have a drink every time Nate speaks when he's muted. Yeah, <laughs> every, every, every game. yeah right. In the saloon, I wouldn't take a shot. And I'm gonna, I don't want to contribute to the <clears throat> delinquency of America or the world, I should say. Um, <laughs> especially Australia. So, the um, very interesting and also cool that you pre game Linux Saloon by doing that. I, I missed the announcement on Twitter. Unless I would have retweeted that. But yeah, very cool. Sravan. Uh, yeah. I what? Go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. So, I mean, well, if you, if you had the dovetail. Go ahead, Colin. Oh, I was going to say the installer for Fedora. Um, you know, speaking of Calamari's before that, they could benefit from definitely adopting Calamari's <laughs> because I don't know if anyone's ever tried doing a um, what would you call uh, not just a straight out install to the disk, but trying to set up your own partitions. That can be. That that can be quite a challenge uh, for me I personally, agree. but I agree. <clears throat> for me too. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it has to take you into what the custom Blivet partitioner that you have to dive hey. into, and then I know I've had to do that a couple times when uh, I decided to install a release, but just do it as a ButterFS subvolume, and that was fun to try to dive into. Yeah, not. Not as simple as other installers, for sure. I, I messed... don't like the. F I, I'm not keen on the fact that they ask you to. Um, what do they call it? Reclaim space, and you go into there and <clears throat> you click on the disk, 
and it says it's got a reclaimed space. And then you you click done and you get out of there. But it doesn't tell you um, the information that you need that it's using that disk. It's still, but if you go back into that again, after you've clicked done, but you go back in there, it's saying it wants to reclaim the space again. And I expected it to tell me that it's already done that, but it goes back to reclaiming space. It's it's really odd in the way that it works because it sort of goes back to the first time you clicked into it instead of saying that you've you've selected this disk and so forth. It's it's still saying to reclaim space. So it's a little bit odd in the way that it works. It's sort of it, it, it's deceiving in 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 what you're seeing and what it's doing. So. I just find it um, challenging for myself personally um, to, to use the Fedora installer. So piggybacking on what like Colin's saying, I find the installer non-linear. Like most install processes, whether it's Windows or Linux, again, I haven't used Mac OS, so I don't know about that. It's like, it's linear. You just click next, 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 you're done. But in Fedora, when you go to the partitioning, everything else is in the bottom right corner. But when you click on the partitioning, when you do the partitioning, to finish it, you have to go to the top left corner. I don't get it. Like everything else is in the bottom right corner. All your main menus in the bottom right corner. Why isn't this in the bottom? You have to click on done, something in the bottom right corner and then you have to go to the top left corner. Click on that. And then you go back to the main menu again, and then again you click on the bottom left uh, and the bottom left right corner. It's like non-linear. It's so counterintuitive. I think personally, the federal devs are so used to it; they don't care about it. Or I, I think Shikal posted on the Telegram chat like they're actually trying to improve it. It's like, like what's the design choice? Like common sense. Like people want to click the next, next, next in the same location. So when you're done partitioning, you want to click next in the bottom right corner, not on the top left corner. Like I know because again, I like playing with stuff. I deal with crazy software. I write my own software. I explore stuff. So it's like, okay, it's in the bottom, the top left corner. But someone who is intermediate user or even a beginner is like, how do I proceed? And they're stuck. It's like, they, they search around for five minutes, it's in the bottom, it's in the top left corner. It's like so confusing. Like, I don't get it. Like, how are the devs so blind to this issue? It's like, they don't care about it or, is, I think it's been an issue for many years now. I don't think I, what I I'm bringing up is new. I did hear that they were thinking about changing it. I heard somewhere, I'm not sure where. No, it's a strange design <laughs> choice. It's like not common sense. I'm not talking about coding, it's like, it's common sense. Like you should have a linear install process. Like so everything is linear. In in uh in January, I think there was a forensics article, and in it they were uh, uh it was stated that Fedora was thinking about. I'm not sure if it's still happening. I put I posted the link. Um, they oh, they yeah. were thinking about moving to cockpit for their installer. So they they I don't know why they didn't consider calamaris, but they were thinking about a creator in their own web-based um, installer using cockpit. I, mean, I personally can figure it out. I've figured out a lot of more complex stuff. <laughs> Again, I'm a researcher, so I, and my job is to figure out complex stuff. But most of the user base is not that, right? Well, like if you, you want to appeal to mainstream, everything should be linear. It should be like, if, even if it's not technical, it should be common sense. It should be based on common sense, in my opinion. So uh, Ron in the chat, he says, I think the design of the installer is such so that a user is focused to think deliberately before committing to an action, maybe. I, I suppose. Ron, that's not how users work, Ron. Come <laughs> on, Ron. If you, know if, you, if you think about it the way he, the way he speculates, it could be because the, the OK button or the confirm buttons is always on the bottom right. And since since you're not saying okay to a window, but like to a setup a procedure, I guess that's why they move it to a different place. Like they said, so maybe you think about it. That's all speculation, of course, because I have, I have no idea if that's fully what they're thinking. So what I think it is, 
is that they want people to talk and complain about it. And so they're focused on the installer being irritating so they don't look at the rest of the distribution. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's, I, was just, I was trying to be funny. Totally a joke. <laughs> That's not meant as a slight. You know what Nate is trying to do? He's trying to push his open source propaganda in a different manner, trying to undermine yeah. our project. Yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> Nailed it. That's absolutely what I'm trying to do. No, I've I found the 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 uh, installer to be a little bit weird how they do that, and it felt just it feels just clunky. But I I guess I don't have real high standards. But when it comes to installers, as long as they do the job. I, I Nate, do like. You should. It's a flagship distro. I know Matt. you're right. You it's are. A, you're like you're you correct. Should. Yeah. And I do like how like Geeko Linux, Gecko Linux. I'm sorry. They make an easy like the Calamari's installer for OpenSUSE, which makes it way easier to set up. So I think that's that's cool. And and maybe maybe that's something that um, the spins could probably look toward. I don't know. But I I actually like the OpenSUSE installer. I, do too. I like all the options, the I, way you can I'm set up all the software you need before you, you, you use the, the computer, you can just set it up and then let it go. I um, also, the drive management too. I like the drive management a lot. Also, it's linear. Again, again I forgot I did it like a couple of months ago. Open source install is linear. Like every, every installer I have encountered, except Fedora, even Ubiquiti, everything is linear except Fedora. So they must be doing something wrong. We should not make excuses for them. What if they're the only ones that are doing it right and everyone else is doing it wrong? I'm just saying, could that, is that a possibility? Maybe, it were, maybe everyone else are the lemmings falling off the cliff without the umbrella, you know, and, and going splat. Is anyone here old to remember Caldera Linux? I can't the installer say. with Caldera, uh, you played Tetris while it installed. <laughs> oh. that, is awesome. you made your selection. That, that, that is actually a good point because uh, usually with uh, Ubuntu, if I'm installing a, like a distro, I have the internet going. So then I, I have a window, a small window for the installer, like a, not, not small, but let's say like half the screen. And then the other half, I'm watching like a YouTube video while it does it. But with Fedora, like it automatically takes up the full screen. And then I always found that a little bit uh, annoying. You can um, work around that by pressing, I think, the menu bar, uh, the menu button, and then it, it lowers the window, and then you can sort of like uh, lower it that way, and then open a, a browser. But um, yeah, it, it, it's a little weird for me. Okay, I think we beat that that horse to a pulp. So now, uh, next is what applications did you add, and what challenges did it provide? I'm sure, Khan has something. He's got he's got that look on his face. Oh, well, I was actually waiting for someone else to, to chime in, but uh, it wasn't uh, forthcoming. Well, you had to crack your I mic, actually, so look, let's go I ahead and... <laughs> All right. Um, I did searches on applications to see whether most of my applications were in the repositories. There's only a couple that weren't there. Um, the one thing that I set out to do was, because I was running Cinnamon, I, um, I decided to install... NVIDIA drivers, because this Toshiba, I think, is probably about eight to 10 years old, I'd have to think. It's a brand new. And it has an, optim has an Optimus, and it's very difficult. Um, but I went to the, um, let me check where it was. It was the rpmfusion.org how-to NVIDIA legacy GeForce. And just, uh, I think I did it the wrong way the first time, so I actually removed everything that I did and then followed this one, and everything worked fine. There's no screen tearing. Um, seems to be working fine. Oh, and don't forget, Cinnamon does not have Wayland, so uh, that that's another problem I don't have to worry about. But mm. that's uh, that's working great. So I was quite impressed with how that worked. It's all... Um, obviously terminal commands, but it was quite simple to follow. Just a couple of uh, commands and I was done. So I was pretty impressed with that. Um, I don't understand the DNF. I don't understand the DNF Dragora. I do some searches in there, but sometimes what I'm searching is not coming up. Hmm. I don't know whether you have to click on something for searches to appear. I, I, I don't understand it. Maybe somebody else here knows how that works. But uh, it looks to me like it's mainly used as an updater. But it does say that it's for installing 
applications as well, but uh, I can't figure it out. <laughs> Does anybody know about that DNF Tragora? Like with the uh... Jinda, did he have an experience with DNF Tragora? Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> what, what's DNF Tragora again? It's, it's a, like synaptic. No, yeah, it's like, it, yeah, it's like yeah, synaptic, uh, but uh, for RPM. Yeah, okay. uh, I uh, I installed the operating system. I went into Discover because I did KDE. And it said I had, oh, a billion updates, you know, 750 or something. So I clicked it <laughs> and, it, you know, it, it, it started installing them and it's like 1.2 gigabyte and it had a little button on it that says when I'm finished, you know, reboot. And instead of like giving you a warning or anything, the screen just went black and it sat there for a little while. Then it finally shut down and started rebooting, rebooted the computer and the updates did nothing. The same 770 were there. So hmm. I went to the... Yeah, DNF Dragon Aura to see if I could update it, and I couldn't get that to work either. So I just went into a DOS, I went into a command prompt and just started typing stuff in, got it to update. After getting it to update, I went back into uh, Discover and typed in VirtualBox, it wasn't there. I went into DNF Explorer, DNF, for, what is it, Dragon Aura, whatever it's called. It, it, VirtualBox wasn't there either. Um, Eris was nice enough to tell me how to get it to update. Again, so I did some more updates with it. Uh, it did eventually get uh, VirtualBox in uh, Dragonora, but it wouldn't do it in um, the default one by KDE Discover. Hmm. It doesn't matter anyway. VirtualBox didn't work. Every time I ran any uh, virtual machines, it just would lock up and die. That's too bad. Ben, you have your hand raised up. Uh, yes, I um, I tried out uh, the. I tried out installing a couple of things like uh, updates, which was no biggie, but anything after that, <laughs> at least on this laptop that I'm talking to you guys on, um, my NVIDIA card is a 2060, uh, a notebook edition. And funnily, uh, the <laughs> install process through RPM Fusion didn't go very well for me. And funnily enough, um, it somehow, I don't know how, managed to go make this and go, and I had to start all over again. And I was like, yeah, not doing that. So unfortunately, after that, I just ended up back on Storm OS, unfortunately. So yeah, things just did not go very well for me in the end. So did anybody have a great experience installing software in Fedora, like for those that did KDE or or GNOME, did the software centers work as expected? I actually had a, a good experience. I'll just say it quick. But but what I usually do is I just run a script for uh, for FlatHub. So I just make sure to install FlatHub, and then I run my script and it installs all the software. Uh, okay. On the ARM, like uh, again, I got it off RPM Fusion. I don't know if it's official or not. Most probably it's not official. The installation instructions weren't clear at all, but I somehow figured it out and got installed. And then, and somehow okay, the packager in, introduced a PyCharm repo, which was outdated. So it didn't update. So it threw up errors every time I ran DNF. So my DNF upgrade took like 25 minutes hmm. and I was able to upgrade my system and like everything ran smooth. I mean, it's a vanilla GNOME experience. So I knew how it worked, but it's it works well, but I found that the install the the update process, especially the initial update process, was very slow. Like it wasn't the download speed, but the actual like DNF install itself, like it was very slow. Like compared to at least Pac-Man, it took like more than twenty five minutes, and it threw up random errors. Maybe the RPM. I I know it's not an official edition, so I can't blame it too much. It's like the repos were out of date. Again, I don't know much about RPM Fusion, about the COPR repos or something. Some mirrors were out of date. This drop errors, but apart from that, like everything was like it's a one in a GNOME experience. If you like GNOME, you're a fan. It's you can you can use it. It was it was not it was working well. Like even though it's an Raspberry Pi, you can get like good GNOME experience on it. Like it's not like it's slow. Like you can get actually good experience of GNOME on Raspberry Pi if hmm. you want to use Fedora 36. That's great. Like everything, like browsing, video watching, everything. Like it's like 
it's like a computer. It's not powerful. I know it's not powerful, but it's a computer. It works for for the most part. It works well. So, so Nate, to- my uh, my biggest uh, hang up was the uh, the policy kit pop up. Uh, I get this a lot when I'm doing remote desktop. The pop up just comes repeated times, uh, and so that's really annoying when you're trying to install software packages. I wonder if that's because of SE Linux. Is that uh, is that know, different from other distros? No, it's not related to SE Linux. Policy kit is different. It's complicated. SE Linux is like app. It's like app permissions. Like policy policy kit is not. But but he said that this is like the number of times is, is unusual for other distros, like compared to other distros, or. Or is this usually something that happens also? So, so what happens in most distros is like once you click enter a password for next like X minutes, it doesn't prompt you for a password again. I think it's mostly like PAM or something. But I, again, I haven't tried it. But I like I do most of my applications in the terminal. So the terminal, like once I use DNF, it didn't ask me once more for the pseudo password. I'm sharing my screen. So just you, know, you can see that uh, it's oh, okay. a little annoying. I got you. So, yeah. uh, okay, so I think that's a um, it's permissions issue. I think you can tweak that so it doesn't do that. I, I it- tried a couple of things, but but yeah, I, I uh, you know, if, if people watching the video, you may run into something similar. Well, I think I'm very excited that you have XIs on your desktop. That's actually what really excites me. Uh, so- you know, some people don't want to switch to Valen because XIs doesn't work on it. That's <laughs> the sole reason. I find it surprising, but that, it's hilarious. That is a very cromulent reason, and it embiggens me that to hear that. So does that meet the application criteria of this uh, part of the call? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think so. So, Tyler, how how is I, you? I could hear you. So, go ahead and whatever your thoughts were. Okay. So initially, uh, like I said, when I went to Ford Fedora thirty six, I didn't really install much software because everything was already installed. Uh, Okay. I upgraded from 35. Uh, so when I did my Twitch stream earlier, that was kind of the real test. Uh, after installing Fedora 36 on this first system, I was easily able to add FlatHub. FlatPak's already installed, so it's just adding the remote for that. Restarting GNOME software, and I was able to grab you know things like Discord, Telegram, OBS Studio, a uh, couple GNOME applications that are on FlatHub. Those were easy to grab. I did go to Vivaldi's website to grab the 64-bit RPM package for the Vivaldi browser, because that is my personal browser of choice. That was easy to install. Uh, RPM Fusion and Codex, uh, just a few commands, and I had all that installed and working really well from the get-go. So that was good. And uh, I just set up, I know some people are going to have a reaction to this, but I just set up Snap on Fedora 36. That's cool. And rebooted, and it appears to be working. Uh, there are some things I prefer to use Snap for, like Bitwarden is officially distributed as a Snap and not a flat pack. And for a password manager, I'm going to go with what the official methods are. I don't Makes care sense. what anyone... Yeah, like I'm not going to go no, with an unofficial... Cool. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I use the the Snap as well. I, I like the way the Snap operates better than the flat pack. That's just my personal yep. opinion. Uh, I also use Discord as a Snap because... Discord is using an old broken version of Electron that I have to use a workaround for. And if I use that workaround to fix the graphical issues, it just crashes and has more graphical issues on the flat pack that the snap does not have. So that came out of necessity. Uh, but yeah, uh, I got the snap store running here. And for example, I'm about to grab the snap version of Discord. So. Cool. So you, you run the snap version of Discord because of an outdated Electron something so yeah i'm having issues with the uh, flat pack specifically where if i do the workaround to fix the graphical issues the outdated electron has then it causes the flat pack to just not work at all okay so hmm, that's interesting do you I'm... get uh, dnf dragora in in that uh install tile uh i don't think it shows with that by default Fault. I have to install that after the fact. And right, is that because it's a spin that that comes with it? Because it doesn't yeah. have a software. Yeah. So that do you know my... what the? So that would be my Sorry. guess. And uh, yeah, I just don't have find a reason to use it because if I'm doing actual package management, I'm typically using DNF. Whereas if I'm wanting to grab software, I'm using tools like the Snap Store or the GNOME Software Center. Yeah, I can. Fair enough. Uh, I think the only thing that I recently ran into, uh, this is kind of a slight tangent, but 
Oh, back to the actual topic. Uh, extensions. I was able to get the stuff for extensions installed and grab the GNOME shell extensions I needed perfectly fine. The slight tangent is uh, when I did an update today on my main system, uh, upgraded to kernel 518, and I typically appreciate that Fedora has up-to-date kernels and they push them. That has actually come to bite me in the butt for the first time today uh, when my capture card does not work with kernel 518 now. Uh, so I reverted back to kernel 517 when I booted up in my last reboot so I could use this capture card and I submitted a ticket with Magewell, hoping that they'll update their drivers to support 5.18 and newer. Otherwise, Tyler, yeah. what do you think about the update process in general? Like, I was on your Steam earlier, you remember? It's like, you started the upgrade, it's like, you took a break, you talked about other things, and then finally you got back and the upgrade was done. Like, what do you think of the upgrade process in general? It can feel annoying because uh, the unattended upgrade process is similar to how you know Windows updates, you it downloads it, then you actually reboot them to finish applying them. Uh, I can understand the advantages though, because it's updating the system files while they're not in use to prevent possible stability issues that you might run into if an application is trying to access a version of a library that is just no longer there. But doesn't it give you a Windows flashback? It's like, wait for a computer until it's up here. It's like, only Windows does that. <laughs> it, it's slightly, uh, but uh, unlike Windows, it's only, you just get that one reboot to the update and then you're back in the operating system. Sometimes, depending on how big the updates on Windows are, you're rebooting three, four times before it's finished. So I do find it's still a lot quicker. Well, my preference, what I really do enjoy is it does require a reboot to apply the updates because of how immutable operating systems work. And this is a, again, a tangent, but I really do enjoy Silverblue and how when you update, you're rebooting to go into that new image. So, but that's for whenever we go to Silverblue in the future. Interesting that you say that. And I'm glad Prophetic's here to hear that. Well, cool. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Thank you very much, Tyler, for your comments. And it's it's interesting. I I use the RPM for uh, for Discord, and I haven't had any issues other than having to update it periodically, where I, it won't let me launch it. But interesting about the the snaps on that one as well. Uh, I, but I, I do have a question Thanks. on on snaps for you. Um, do you have any issues with snaps on Fedora? Uh, unfortunately, yes, I do. Uh... Generally, most of them have been gone uh, since I've upgraded to 36. Uh, the biggest issue I've run into is fonts. It, fonts after so many upgrades of a snap will just go completely wonky. Oh, uh, the squares? Yep, the squares, especially in Discord. And sometimes I can ignore that, but other times like I will hop into a Discord group that is about language learning. And... You know, I've started picking up some Korean and trying to learn how to read Hangul lately. And when that happens, I can't read that at all. It just all ends up as squares and that becomes useless to me, unfortunately. Uh, thankfully, a quick reinstall typically takes care of that. Uh, but when I was on Fedora 35, that did not work. And until I upgraded to the newer version of Snap that came with Fedora 36, I was stuck with squares. So how often, uh, so I got a question for you uh, with the RPM. How often does the RPM, when it forces you to upgrade the package in order to launch, how often are you typically having to wait between that happening and the RPM getting updated? Because I used to do that with the Debian package back when I was on Ubuntu-based systems. But because there was that gap where I couldn't use Discord, if it took a little longer for them to update that package, uh, I ended up just going to the snap or the flat pack because that would update quicker and I had no problems. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. I had it happen recently, which was annoying, but it's only annoying. It doesn't, it's not like a, this means I have to update. So usually I just do, you know, system updates, whatever. Cause I'm, I know Servan's probably going to want to reach through his computer and slap me, but sometimes I don't roll my distribution forward as often as I should. And so I can see him laughing at me right now. And uh, and so 
I have to just then do updates, you know, a full update, whatever on things. That, that's certainly fine, Nate. Like, it, it depends on, like, what packages you're using, what's your internet speed, Sometimes how fast that. you want to roll. <laughs> like, you can you can update once a week. I think in rolling resource distribution, it's a myth that you have to update every day. You can upgrade once a week and get away with it. So I, once in two weeks is a stretch. Once in a month, never do it. <laughs> so I, I always do what I never should do with Tumbleweed. Eris, you got your hand up. Um, I, I also run snaps. Uh, I'm running the Zoom snap because the flat pack, for whatever reason, has been like maybe like a month and a half. It hasn't been working for me. It works initially, but then my microphone doesn't work. And I found out that that's apparently that's an issue that people have not experienced with, with the, the flat pack. But I think it's just the newest versions of Zoom that's like that for, for uh, webcams and microphones that are USB. So I'm using the Snap for that. I'm, I'm also using Firefox Snap. Seems like it's working, but I haven't, I haven't used it for a long time. Hmm. So One I have issue, a question what, for you, Aris. Uh, like, yes. It's like Snaps and flat packs were supposed to solve this issue, right? What, what like is it's it? like, it's like, like there are different like system libraries for different distros, but okay, these flat packs and snaps have their own libraries, so they shouldn't break. It's, but it's they not are. An, I find it surprising. It's not an issue with with the the flat pack. It's the the snap has an old version of Zoom. I think the issue is Zoom for whatever reason they switched something with a uh, with Zoom that made it not compatible with with USB mics. At least mine is, and some webcams that I've heard. One, one issue that I did come across, which I think it is Fedora's fault in part, but it might be the Snap also, is that when I I search for something on Firefox, which is a Snap, and it doesn't um, it doesn't find it, I get the PC speaker, and that's actually a, a pet peeve of mine. When I I, I, I hear the the PC speaker for <laughs> an error or attention, it's just so annoying because <laughs> I have like. I have either speakers on or I have the uh, <laughs> headphones on and I just hear the PC speaker. So I, I wish they would turn that off by default. You can unplug it. This is on Plasma. Well, the best thing I discovered for myself when it comes to flat packs, because I don't really like jumping from flat packs to snaps if I can get away with it, was this KDN Live issue I was talking about last week where I used the commit to, to, down, to downgrade KDN Live back to the previous version before that update and everything's working fine so I, I love the fact that you can actually use a commit to downgrade your package to, to the version it, it, you're not going back a whole version or whatever just that point just that one mm -hmm. point you're going back just before that recent update and everything's working fine so I, that that to me is a great discovery because anything goes wrong i'll just uh use the commit to downgrade again and then maybe and what i've done is i've pinned that up so it doesn't actually i've not pinned i've masked it so you can mask an app you can mask the flat pack so it doesn't upgrade so That's i've done awesome. that as well yeah so that that way i stay on that version till you know maybe i'll try again in a couple of months time and see if it's working okay and it's and and the bugs have been ironed out so obviously Flat packs have the same problems as repositories. Maybe somebody's just missed missed out a, a bit of code or something. You know, I, I, that that's how I can see the problem must be. It's just missed code or something like that. Or Mr. McBride, do you run snaps at all on any of your machines? Absolutely not. At, okay, so you're one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Um, Two Fine. reasons. One, um, I like to stay as much within the repo of a distribution. Um, personally, myself, it's because I like to have all my updates and notifications coming from a single source. Okay. I think that makes perfect sense, truly. Really. I, I find that um, for me, you know, it's nice running sudo zipper dup on my tumbleweed machines and then having to do flat pack separately. Although I don't mess with snaps because I think they just kind of auto update on their own. But I was curious. Yeah, the 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 political. Oh, I think I lost you. Yeah, you said something, and then it, and we haven't heard you ever since like the second word. Not so. Uh, can I just uh, put myself in here, Nate? 
Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I think we'll wait for Mr. McBride. Um, I was going to, yeah, I was going to say um, uh, the Fedora Cinnamon out of the box is quite nice. Um, the way they've themed it and everything out of the box is really good. And also, I did install Codex, which Tyler was talking about earlier. And um, I think the, the Lib DVD CSS as well. And I tried because this laptop also has a DVD player and everything's working. So, you know, all of those things, um, plus the NVIDIA and everything, everything's working. So, yep, can't complain. And it was quite a reasonably easy experience because for me, I can get lost very easy <laughs> as I do sometimes in my videos. But um, it, everything was uh, not too hard to work out. So, yeah, it's impressive. That's cool. Anybody, anybody else have anything on their uh, application hunting? Yes, Sirvan. Not not about the application, but about documentation. Okay. It's like uh, I have a request for the Fedora devs and probably ARM devs. It's apparent from the documentation that they don't care about like ARM at all because they don't support Raspberry Pi 4. If you look at the documentation, either it's too old or it's like, they straight up say, we don't support Raspberry Pi 4. Hmm. Raspberry Pi 4 is the most common single board computer on this planet. Like it's the most supported single board computer. It's the most common. It has the most OS support, like, like number of units, everything. They support Raspberry Pi 2 and 3. It's like, so it's Pi 400, right? It's based on Pi 4. It's the same processor. So if anything Such supports Pi 4, yes, I agree. Like if anything supports Pi 4, it's uh, supports Pi 400. That's why it's called Pi 400. They don't support it out of the box. Somehow Grumpy found me hmm. a link for an RPM Fusion site, which shows me Raspberry Pi 4 support. Okay, I go to the image. They don't have instructions on how to burn the image. None. Not even a subsection linking to some other website. Nothing. Like could, none. Could you just they use assume a... you know how you burn the image. It's like, I know how to burn the image. Like I've been playing around with ARM. I'm developing for ARM. I know stuff. Like imagine a Raspberry Pi like owner who use Raspbian. Like how come they don't give you instructions on how to burn the image? And it's like complicated. And after you burn the image, after you do the install, after the first boot, they give you manual instructions to resize the image. But the initial image is only like 8 GB or something. You have to run a terminal command to resize the image to, to use your entire uh, micro SD card. Like all these things are so complicated. I'm so disappointed again. Fedora is a is a flagship distribution. Again, it's by Red Hat. Like Ubuntu is by Canonical. It's a flagship Linux distribution. People know about it. Whatever you think about Red Hat or something, people know about Fedora, and they don't support ARM. Like, forget about other devices like Android or whatever. Like, if you don't support Raspberry Pi, you don't even support other stuff. I don't get it. It's like ARM is becoming more prominent. Again, it's mainly due to Apple M1, but ARM, um, I don't like. I don't think ARM is the future, but ARM will play a major part. Like you don't even care about it. I find it disappointing and sad. I urge Fedora community and developers to play. Just pay more attention. Pay more attention to documentation. Try to be su more supportive. They don't support it official. Try to support it. Like at least have something which works out of the box. I find it very disappointing and sad. Like as an ARM enthusiast, I find it sad. I urge them to pay more attention to it. I, I will say, uh, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that passion for for ARM for sure. I also agree that the Pi Four Four Hundred is the it's the best Pi for sure, and and I I. I don't have as many of those as I do Pi 3s, but as far as like the, it's the, the fun of the computer, they have the most fun of any ARM-based system that I have. I mean, I do things with other ARM, like BeagleBone, whatever, but those aren't as fun necessarily to do things with. But the Pi 400 
you can do so much with the Pi 400. It does seem unfortunate they don't have a Pi 400 image and four 400 image, but it seems like that would be an easy thing for them to do to turn on the builders for that because OpenSUSE well, has it. I have a question. It. Sure. Um, because when I go to the, the Fedora download page, there is Fedora download for ARM. And yes, that's ARM64. It's a generic mainline kernel that doesn't okay. boot for most devices. I, oh, ARM awesome. is a different architecture. I think we talked about in the uh, Telegram chat with Shiko. He brought about points about Fedora's philosophy. But if you just follow Fedora's philosophy, you'll never support ARM. Like ARM works different. Like you have to actually put effort to in the kernel, the other stuff, you have to pass the kernel. You have to use a different kernel. You have to, you have to use different drivers and other stuff to make it work out of the box. It seems Fedora's principle is like, you ship the mainline arch. That doesn't work for us. It okay. never works. I understand. Thank you. I think that's the issue there, though, is that they they take you have to care, and I think projects have and the right to to draw the line in the sand and say, we'll go up to here and let the community take it from there. And I think it's okay, but I think it's good that you. It's that's what's so great about the open source community is that. You can advocate, you can persuade, and maybe, who knows, you can convince them. I think this goes back to maybe Fedora's philosophy that it's up upstream first. Maybe they, yeah. th the way they, they, they don't make their own kernel, like they try to use the upstream kernel as much as possible. Uh, but at is they can use a Raspberry Pi official upstream kernel. Like Raspberry Pi maintains their own branch of Linux kernel. That's official. You can use them. If you use them, you can put Pi 400, Pi 3, Pi 2, everything over a 515 kernel. Hmm. But you don't need to use 518. You just need to use 515 Raspberry Pi official kernel. You'll boot everything fine. They don't want to do that. I find it so surprising. Ashrenance nice does that. Going back to one thing you said that I forgot to respond to, you said that Pac-Man is faster than Fedora. To be fair to Fedora, the way their DNF works, I think it, it downloads the package, then it installs it. There's like a scriptlet uh, stage, and then it verifies that the, the package was received correctly. And I think that verification adds up to the time for DNF to work, which other package managers do not do, I think. I found that process to be slow. Again, like, I think mostly you observe the slowness and like weaker hardware. Like in normal computers, like I don't think like you love when when my daily driver computer is fast, right? Like all this stuff is like fast, but I, I, in my opinion, code should be efficient. Everything should be efficient. But if it is that slow, like it takes 25 minutes to upgrade your computer, that's unreasonable. Like when I build images for Endeavor's arm, I can build a complete image in 11 minutes. Like updating your computer should not take more than that time. It's it's ridiculous for me. I would say the slowest part of the DNF experience I have is not even DNF itself. It's that some of the repos I connect to are perhaps a bit slower to download from than they ought to be. DNF itself, I've actually not really had an issue with. It, it's but how, how good is your hardware? Again, I play with single board computers. The hardware is not good. So you, if it, it really differentiates how good your code is, how good, how fast your package manager is, because my hardware is weak. I admit my hardware is not good, but that's how I rate things. If I use Fedora on my computer, obviously I don't think it would matter a lot. I'm willing to bet there's a flag that you could turn off those checks uh, if you dig into it to speed it up. I don't know if you want to do that, but I think you could. I don't want to do that. Like for package manager, my personal experience, I'll stick with defaults. I don't care. I don't want to mess my account. In my opinion, in a Linux distro, the package manager is the most important thing and you never want to mess with it unless you exactly know what you're doing. I will never mess with a package manager, never. No, it could probably just be a flag. I know I, I've, I've set some flags like in Zipper and OpenSUSE to for a specific purpose, not to skip checks. I don't think I don't know if it does the same kind of checks. I know it it does yeah, checks before yeah, it installs. You are an expert, right, Nate? 
You're an no, expert. No, 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 no. I will never. For 20 years or something? Ten, uh, like Come on, 11 Mitch. or 12. But I'm not an expert. I'm a seasoned <laughs> novice at best. <laughs> 12 years of using open source, so you know what you're doing. Like, but I have just tried Fedora for this exploration. I don't know what I'm doing. And there's a difference, right? Yeah. Well, Shrevan, kind of... do you, for... oh, no, go ahead. Whatever. Eris, you, you had something organic. Go ahead and I, I was going to I was going to ask. I was going to ask Ravon one, one quick question. For for Arch Linux, for Pac-Man, you don't update your mirrors? You don't do that uh, mirror thing? I forgot what it's called. Um, no, that, there's no reflection of her arm. Arm is different. You just so, have like 10 mirrors or something. But do you do that for like for for six, for X, X64? Do you, do you, do yeah, you but only your... once in the beginning and once every couple of months. OK. You don't do that very often because generally mirrors work. And you generally want the mirrors close to you. So if you are in US, you select US mirrors, get mirrors close to you. You run that reflect, it's called the reflector utility. You run yes. that once and then you're good for the most part. If something goes wrong, you run it again in like a couple of months. Like some mirrors die, like people don't maintain. But for Arch Linux ARM, there are only like 20 mirrors worldwide. For Arch Linux X64, probably there are more than 200 or 300 mirrors. So there's an order of magnitude. So you don't care. For me, I just choose the Illinois or Florida or New Jersey mirrors. That's it. So okay. for me, I don't I don't need to worry about that because I know there are only like three mirrors close to me. Okay. Thanks. That's cool. Prophetic. I was gonna ask you something. I don't remember now. Well, I was going to just say, uh, while you think, we can cook up the question. In the meantime, I got something I want to throw on the on the stove for you guys. Throw, so throw that arms. question out there. Uh, I probably have to defrost that question now. We can use the food analogy. <laughs> it's, called, it's called, to solve all your problems on ARM, it's called PARM, Puppy Linux for ARM. <laughs> and just, cook, just go with that, and you're good. Just do that. It's probably good with the system utilization. Yep, yeah, just solve all your problems. I like it. Thank, thanks but for But property was the fun in that. You have to try, like, Linux Southern is about trying different things, experiencing different things, giving the feedback to the community so that we can improve stuff. Have you tried that's, Parm? That's, Par, Parm is, uh, once you go Parm, you never go back. So it's like, you know, the most, the highest of experiences. So. And, and Parm is really good on spaghetti. So there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think we kind of talked about any the areas you found difficult. I think we kind of moved into that subject already. Is there any other areas that you found difficult with Fedora in, in your exploration, your journey, or Tyler in your time using it, some areas you wish maybe had to knock off some of the rough edges? I mean, so far I've been on Fedora as my daily driver for the last two years, and I've generally been quite satisfied with it. Uh, the biggest, like a couple of rough spots I've noticed with like GNOME 42 is like when I, I do really do appreciate the new ability in the settings to select a dark mode. But I wish when I go from like light to dark or dark to light, I wish it wouldn't touch my wallpaper. Keep that separate. For some reason, they like to tie a wallpaper to each mode. And like I have a wallpaper set, leave it alone, please. Uh, is that a gnomism? That's one of the gnomisms. And like I said, and this is, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I really, really appreciate that Fedora keeps some of the core components updated, such as, you know, releasing newer kernels to the current release. Uh, I have been the two years up until today, I've not ran into an issue with that. It was just today that's like, oh, my capture card doesn't support kernel 518 yet. Uh, I guess I'm rebooting back into kernel 517. So, Slight hiccup there. I'm sure there'll be a driver update for my uh, capture card soon enough. But as it stands right now, I'm behind a kernel version because my capture card and I, I need that for things. Um, of course. So, but otherwise, it, it's it's been smooth sailing. Uh, I wish, and this is maybe not entirely Fedora, could be a bit on both camps, but Snaps, I know they're not officially supported on Fedora. But SnapD is in the repos and easily accessible to install and download. And uh, there are, I think this is more of a Snap issue. I think Snaps outside of Ubuntu just have weirdness that don't exist within Ubuntu. I think those are the biggest items. Uh, 
except I, I just have a lot of positive things to speak of Fedora and its stability that I've had with it over the last two years of using it. I think, I don't think, I think it's a, the font issue in Fedora is actually more than just, um, it, it's, it's a snap issue. Cause I know I have it in OpenSUSE as well, where all of a sudden it turns in a bunch of squares for certain fonts. And I, and there is a, um, an article that I have, it's an article forum post in the snapcraft.io that how to, how to fix that problem. So I put it, I put it in the, uh, in the chat and what that'll yeah, do is I, that normally does it for me. That normally yeah. works. It was towards the end of the 35 or end of the time that I was on 35 waiting for 36 to come out where that was just not working at all. Uh, thankfully 36, I don't have an issue with it right now, but it's it just some general weirdness, but not really for Dora's I mean, it maybe it's probably not entirely Fedora's problem though. So I don't think it is. I think, I think it's a, I think it's a snap issue. So, um, any other thoughts on Fedora, real quick? You know, we have we have we have some missed opportunities that Servan brought up about about ARM, but uh, I don't know if Jinda, if you have anything on Fedora, or Mr. McBride, if you have anything else on Fedora you want to throw out there. I do not. I did not try it. Oh, no worries. I don't know Jinda, if you had any any thoughts about Fedora that maybe maybe we just didn't didn't hit that I think should be brought up. No, not really. It's just every time I try to use it, it's always constant battle trying to get it to update. I, I've never had Fedora update for, I don't know, the last 15 years. I, I don't think it's ever <laughs> updated for me, right? Okay. I, so I, what I would say is, is kind of me about Fedora is, is they, if you notice, there aren't a lot of forks of Fedora. It's, it's, uh, Fedora has one of those, those uh, organization cultures that if somebody starts doing something, they'll be like, hey, you can just fold right into the project. So Fedora is kind of a, a Morpheus of, of what the, the community really wants. So I think Servan, I think he brought up some really good points about how maybe they're not hitting the arm area as much. And it could be that maybe people in the Fedora community are not quite as arm heavy as other communities. And that's probably why, because it's, it's one of those projects where people do mm -hmm. work on what they want to work on and... Maybe they yes. haven't attracted the right arm people at this point. So, Servant, since I understand you do a Thank really you. good job with uh, Endeavor OS Arm, you know maybe uh, maybe a guy like you should reach out to the Fedora community and and make some uh, some awesome yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, huh? I was actually thinking about doing that, but I don't know who the correct people to contact. But maybe over the next few weeks, after I actually learn and research more, because well, now all the information I got was from the next to learn community about the different repos they have. Again, I don't know more about Fedora, but if I know the current people to reach out to, I would actually do that because again, I'm not like, you have to use Endeavor as ARM. I'm not like that. It's like, we have to all grow together because ARM will become more prevalent. I'm sure of that. So yeah, we have to all grow together. It's not possible if you're selfish, we have to share knowledge, we have to share the passion. I, I hope someone in the Fedora community picks up because I will not probably do that because I will stick with an Arch base for sure because that's what I'm comfortable with. Arch is my first distro apart from WSO, but I would like right, like to see someone else like actually like take up that ARM project for Fedora because I don't think it's too hard to port over ARM stuff. So I've done it for like two different devices. It's, you need to know a little bit, but it's it's not that hard. You just need you need you just, you just need to put time and experiment a little bit. So it what takes you, effort though. What you could do is go on to the Destination Linux forum or Tux Digital forum. It's still called the Destination Linux forum, but it's the Tux Probably Digital forum. You have to change it. <laughs> well, I guess I guess it's gonna be bigger, a bigger I'm pain. I'm active there. Okay, so you could go on there and probably just do a um, like in the general section say hey i want to help out with this who who, do you, who in the fedora community should i contact and that you could probably find somebody and i i i can't imagine th that they would be like no we don't want that i i think that you could, it would be probably something i'd really appreciate and they probably again, even have some again, like one issue with arm is that the hardware because of chip shortage and other things is not readily available right now that's why many people can't even get those devices, even if they want overpaying for it. 
So that's why I'm like, okay, not many people have the ARM devices to actually like contribute. Like you need to actually have the hardware to know the challenges and also to work with the hardware, right? It's because it's the kernel stuff and other stuff. I, 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 I sympathize with the people who work on this stuff because there's a very small community. But again, now the ch I think the chip shortage is going away slowly. So more and more devices are being available, but like I'll, I'll post there, but I have to do my own research again. I don't want to like urge a community about doing nothing when I haven't done research about it. I will do my research. I'll have a detailed post if possible about how Fedora can improve an arm. Yeah. In many ways, it's the the initial getting it rolling is probably the hardest part because once it's there and people are using yes, it, then, then that's that's when it's going to become more valuable. So, so. so for the Endeavor OS ARM project, there was a community member called Pudge who took the lead like two years ago. Is like, uh -huh. I want to get Endeavor OS on ARM. Like he took the lead. He's still the project lead. Like without him, I don't think we would have an addition. Like someone has to take the initiative for sure, and has to have the passion for it and has to actually put in the effort. It's a lot of effort. Like you you can't expect things to work on ARM because each hardware is different. Right. There's no mainline kernel support. So you have to put an effort and that takes a lot of passion for ARM devices from the person who's leading that. Eris just put a link in the uh, YouTube chat. That's uh, the Fedora Special Interest Group. So may maybe you can check that out too. Okay. So very cool. Thank you so much. And uh, so we have to do this very quickly because we're almost out of time here. Uh, why should you give Fedora a spin? And I'm going to go around. And uh, so, so Eris, you Fedora. are sitting, I'm setting it up here. You're sitting in a bus stop. It's late at night and somebody's actually doing graffiti on it. And, and he pauses and he sees your laptop and he says, hey, I was thinking about installing Fedora on, on my home system when I'm, when I'm done tagging this bus stop. What do you? Uh, what do you? Why do you think I should? I should try Fedora. Come hither, young lad. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fedora is a distro that tries to be the first distro to implement new technologies into Linux. So they, if you try out Fedora, let's say thirty six, you will probably try out something that will come to other distros within a year, maybe two years afterwards. Um, Fedora tries to give you the latest packages once it's released and anything that they can update during release, they will, they will, or you will have to wait until the next version, will, which will come, um, twice a year, like we mentioned at the beginning. So you will always have the latest packages in some way, or maybe a little bit behind. And, um, they try to focus on open source and working with upstream. So they being part of Fedora and the project usually uh, means that your work will also contribute to other distributions. That's, that's a good point. And, and it'll probably be done tagging the, the bus stop and then go back and, and install it. Sirvan, so let's say the garbage man is hanging off the back of the truck. He's ready to pick up your garbage and throw it in. And he sees and he asks, hey, why should I give Fedora a spin? Fedora is the desktop leader for Linux. Earlier it was Ubuntu, but it's not Fedora. They were the first distro to implement Pipewire, first distro to implement Valent. They are leading the desktop revolution of Linux. It's not Ubuntu anymore. So that's why we have to take Fedora seriously. We have to support them because they are pioneering the Linux desktop. Okay. The desktop pioneer. I like it. So Colin. Geez, where am I? Um, so the not uh, elevated this time. No, 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 no. You you're actually in a boxing Some... room with, with a wallaby, and um... <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to sell this to a wallaby. Geez, that's well, going to be pretty tough. Well, actually, <laughs> sell me if we're if we're. Well, um, yeah. I would. Well, I would have to say that um, uh, Fedora is. Uh, Pretty much um, a distro that that has uh, up to date packages. Um, I know some people that use it that uh, it's fairly stable. Um, things are 
fairly easy to install on the main uh, mainstream desktop. So if you install an, um, the GNOME desktop or it sounds like the KDE Plasma, um, you could have a reasonably good experience. It's got plenty of packages available, it's stable. And yes, I agree with the leading edge thing as well. They seem to be always on top of things with the, um, uh, what do you say, the pioneering of uh, Linux desktop. I, I agree with that because they're, they're moving it, they're constantly moving it forward. So, uh, and I've tried it and it seems to be pretty good. Just be wary of the install. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like it. And then the Wallaby knocks me out. All right, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so Jinda, there's a the, the crane operator who uh, was picking up the the windmill turbines. He uh, he was on his smoke break, and he asks you why he should try Fedora. And while he's uh, puffing out his Marlboro Reds, what would you tell ooh, him? Ooh. Uh, uh, for the latest and greatest software. You've got to go with Fedora. It always okay. has the pipe wire and Wayland, and you know, it is the I, I I'm gonna have to agree. It's it is the leader. Excellent. So you probably got, you probably got that in before he chiefed it down. So, Mark. So Mark, you uh you stop by and you you pick up a hitchhiker, even though you're not supposed to, <laughs> and and when he gets in. He smells a little bit like, like a bag of onions, but he asks you uh, about, he sees your, your Fedora pin that you're wearing and says, you know, I was thinking about installing Fedora on my laptop. What, um, what, what do you think is a, a reason I should? You know, if, if, uh, if you're going to be in the Red Hat Fedora world, and you want to be using the same RPM packages, um, and so go with the Fedora desktop if you have, uh, you know, if you have requirements to also, you know, fully support Red Hat, uh, some sysadmins and such may have that. And, and that's what I would say. Um, uh, you know, try to, it, 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 I believe it's RPM compatible, right? And yep, it's RPM. you're in that RPM, RPM world, uh, DNF packaging, uh, all of that, I think uh, Fedora is the desktop to choose uh, for that uh, if you're going to stay in that world. And cool. then get out of my car. <laughs> Beautiful. So Tyler, you, uh, you went into a coffee shop and you're buying a bag of beans and they're getting ready to ask you if you want them ground or not, but then they notice your, your bag it has a, a Fedora sticker on it. It says, "Hey, you know, I was thinking about installing Fedora on this uh, on this cash register here. What, what do you what do you think would be the um, the a reason I should I shouldn't do that?" First, I'd be questioning why the cash register. <laughs> well, it was running Windows XP and it's broken. Right, uh, but ultimately, what attracted me to Fedora is it was kind of that middle ground. You got up to date hardware support through updated kernels and the Mesa stack. But it wasn't, but you didn't have to go completely rolling like you did with like going with like an arch based distribution or going with OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. It provided that nice middle ground. Uh, I didn't have to worry about like GNOME being updated during the release cycle and all of a sudden I upgrade and my extensions don't work. I can comfortably sit on the current version of GNOME until the next Fedora release comes out, but I still have the hardware support with the newer kernels which was extremely important at the time when I switched to Fedora because I had a 5700 XT and support for it, for it was still kind of early on. Uh, so that was, so yeah, that balance of new technologies, new hardware support without full rolling. I think that's really good on the, on the uh, hardware support without the rolling. I, there is something to be said just to dovetail into that. About about how they they do seem to really concentrate on their hardware enablement. I think that's that's really good that they do that. So prophetic, you're at a county fair, and you got separated from your family. You had to go in a Ferris wheel seat 
with a stranger. And you're going to be in this for a little while here. Uh, and, they, and they notice that you're not running Puppy Linux for whatever reason. And they say, I heard about this Fedora thing. Why should I run Fedora? After wiping the tears from my eyes from me not running Puppy Linux and being scared <laughs> of heights, um, I would probably tell them that it's the best balance of like the being the leading edge. Um, and I hear the community is awesome. So if you need help or want to do something special, uh, you can jump right in. And I would be gripping onto them nice and tight until the ride was over. You hold his hand. Yep. Yeah, that's fair. Well, thank you. Mr. McBride, you're still there. Your screen went blank. I'm still here. Okay. So you're in a bank. And, and the bank is getting robbed. They got a, like a, a team of people. And, and the guy in the back, so everyone's on the ground. And he notices you have a computer bag. And he asks you, hey, do you run Fedora? I heard it's great. No, but you can't see it because he's, he's got a mask on, you know, his face mask, hockey mask. He says, why should I run Fedora? But, but you can't make eye contact, okay? What would you tell him? I uh, think you have me confused with someone else. <laughs> All right, that's fair. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, well, well, thank you for indulging me on my, on my, on my crazy train of, of um, whatever it is I was doing here. And actually, Prophetic, you had a really good one in the chat. Uh, it made me laugh. But I, I couldn't just repeat it because then it would be like plagiarism. So we can, I'll use that next time and not tell you. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. I think Fedora is, uh, is pretty darn great. And I, I, it would, it's actually my second distro that I go to. Like if, it's, if not for OpenSUSE, I'd probably be on Fedora right now because i think open is is leading is it's not quite as leading edge as fedora uh, but it it rolls pretty quick so it's it's to me it's kind of a it's a different kind of happy medium so and and i appreciate that open was on butterfs before fedora this is true oh snap uh so which is on Fe right yeah and open <laughs> is the best bunch of this tool called snapper I, I do think that's also good, but I, there's a lot of other good tools out there too. I think uh, there's one, what, which, there's one I, I, I disagree. Saw. Snapper is the best. Okay, <laughs> Snapper's the best. I'm not going to argue that. All right, hey, Snapper. So next week, next week is an open mic night. So uh, bring your topics, whatever they are. It could be from Destination Linux forum, Text Digital forum. Whenever projects. that gets rebranded, projects you're working on, any anything cool that you think in Linux tech, open source, bring them. Uh, we can, in, if you want, you can start, you know, putting them in in the chat. You know, uh, tag it, um, open mic night. Maybe tag me in it as well, and I'll make sure it gets on the list. So I would love that. Thank you so much for doing it. Whoever does, ends up doing it, and uh, and it'll be, we have a a great chat. You can fill up our our topic. Also, if you have any ideas for other Linux distributions we should try, uh, you can send a, uh, the suggestions at linuxloon.com or you can do it also tag it in the forum as well for, um, for distro exploration as well. Tag me or Eris. Eris is the organized one, not me. All right, so uh, we have just, a, I know we're actually over on time, but I, I really wanted to, I started late, that's my excuse. I wanted to muddle through the, the Linux news as always, a big thanks to Michael of this, week's, of this Week in Linux for mixing up a great flight of topics. We only have time for one, and I just wanted to bring this up because I have my Steam Deck and I love it. And I wanted to say uh, this: the Steam Summer Sale is on, and I wanted to apologize in advance for enabling you. Um, Matt, my co-host on Linux Out Loud, he is usually the enabler, but uh, there are You'll find games in the Steam Summer Sale for up to 80% off the regular prices. The sale is usually one of the biggest sales of the year, so there are many types of games with discounts for this year. Platformers like Hollow Knight and Skull, or games like V Rising, Borderlands 3, No Man's Sky, Unrailed, Control, Disco, El Asylum, and most importantly, everyone, most importantly, so go ahead and sit on your drinks. Eye contact, please. Uh, 
a ton of the Lego games are on sale. So if you like like Lego Incredibles or any of the stuff that's on sale right now, I got it for like three ninety nine, and uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So does anybody here uh, do much Steam gaming, or are they do they look for sales or anything like that, or am I the cheese that stands alone on that one? And that was a poor choice in topic. <laughs> I bought a bunch of games in 2017 and 2018. I yeah. haven't found time to play any one of them yet. Well, that's because you're building an ARM-based distribution for Endeavor OS. So maybe you should stop being productive and, and start wasting your time like the rest no, of us. No, that's just the last year. <laughs> but I was saying like 20, 2018. It's been three years since then. Nah. Okay. Uh, it's, I've, I've, I've bought games on sale on Steam. They're fun, but it's like, I don't find time to play them. It's understandable. I, I find other interesting things. It's not yep. like I have no time. I find other interesting things, more creative stuff. Uh, the like reality developing, is developing, etc. Yeah, the, re the reality is I only have like 15, 20 minutes of like attention span I can give to a video game and then I have to jump to the next thing. But yes. sometimes it's yes. fun to just kind of unwind. You know, like when, you're, when, you're, when your brain has like vapor lock and you just need to kind of do something to... Um, you know, whatever. I find them fun. But. You know, when I do that, I consume Linux content and other stuff like yours and other people's. Oh, well, thank you. It's nice to expand your knowledge. It is. So you must have a bigger, a bigger brain than mine because sometimes I have to like let, let the air out a little bit. And uh, I sleep you know. then. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I, I just thought for those that do care about you know, games. I don't know how many how many are gamers out there, but hopefully uh, they can get a deal. All right. So uh, Steve wasn't here today because he had other things. But make sure you catch him tomorrow morning for the uh, the coffee clash clatch. I'm always wondering if I'm saying that wrong. Coffee clatch at 8 a.m. Central or 9 a.m. Eastern. You know, if you're living in the the uh, civilized world, and then Mark. The Atlanta Linux Users Group, are they meeting tomorrow? Yes, we meet every Sunday, uh, 3 to 6 e uh, U.S. Eastern. And uh, you can get more e uh, details at ale.org, A-L-E dot O-R-G. Uh, Linux Out Loud uh, comes out on Wednesday, and we are talking about burnout. So if you are someone that experiences burnout in what you do, so Servan, don't burn out. We need, we need you to keep doing what you're doing. So what you can do to prevent burnout, my suggestion, hop on a Linux saloon. You can chat with us and, and uh, unwind and, and uh, poke fun at me when I don't unmute my mic. If you want more things on me, you can go to cubicle8.com. And is, does anybody else have anything they want to plug? Tyler, you do a caffeinated Linux show. What, is, uh, what does that normally consist of? So... I stream on Twitch under the caffeinated Linux name, and I stream a variety of things. Uh, Duolingo for language learning, GeoGuessr. Uh, play some. Sometimes I'll play some Switch games on stream. I need to get into doing some playing Euro Truck Simulator on stream, like uh, Zeb used to do. Uh, and occasionally I'll do coffee tasting streams with collabing with other people. So, are you interested in any of those games that are for sale on the Steam sale that I? It seemingly got crickets when I brought it up. I haven't checked. Uh, I do want to double check if there are any uh, Euro or American Truck Simulator expansions for sale, though. Cool. Hopefully you find something that works for you. I, uh, I joined last week and uh, learned that new game, the Geo, Geo Chaser. And uh, what was it called again? Geo Guesser. And yeah, it, Geo it's Geo Yeah. Thank you, so thank you for that. I played once. It's fun when you play with a group of friends. Like all of you try to find the same thing. It's fun. I tried it only once or twice, but I haven't since. Yeah. It's really fun. Uh, I found this program called Chat Guesser, and it's a lot of fun to set that up. And then people can submit their own guesses while you're on a round on stream. And then you put on your guess and see who's the closest. Well, I think you should put a link to that game in the YouTube chat so that. Um... You know, other people can check that out or, or link to your video of you doing that. That'd be good too. If you have any of the, those, those resources, I will also put those in the description slash show notes and um, we can, this way others can, uh, can check that out. 
Linux Loon is part of the Tux Digital Network. Check out more great shows at tuxdigital.com. I want to thank you all for being a part of the conversation in both the Zoom meeting and the YouTube stream, as well as everyone involved in making Linux and open source tools out there for us. It allows us to have enjoy our technology and, and have this conversation. Linux truly puts personal back in a personal computer. Thank you for stopping by. Be sure to tip your developers and please remember to Linux responsibly. See us. Watch out for Bye. those wallabies. Uh, in my defense, it wasn't a wallaby. It was a massive kangaroo that okay. KO'd me, to be honest. He didn't like the installer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. You do the kangaroos, Colin. That's wild. <laughs> I think wallaby is more fun to I say than kangaroo. <laughs> no, kangaroo. Oy. We'll try that again. <laughs> it's starting off with a great. Starting off great. You muted, Nate. Uh, you're muted, Nate. Of course I am. It's another 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 thing for the blooper reel. That was, that was for you, Eris. Oh, that was for me? Yeah. Um, uh, you're, you're muted, Nate. Nope. Tyler, we can't okay. hear you. No, it still doesn't work. Can't, I can't hear you, Tyler. You're muted, Tyler. <laughs> you just pulled a Nate, so congratulations. <laughs> I don't think he has a hardware switch. You have one, and you don't know how to use it. <laughs> I, I, I know how to yeah. use it. I don't know how to unuse it is the problem. Ha, 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 ha.